As we um, <clears throat> begin, let me just read um, the, the verse that we're going to be looking at, which is verse, I believe, 27 of Luke chapter 10, where um, the lawyer was asked by Jesus, when Jesus was asked by him, um, what he had to do to inherit eternal life. And then he said, well, what do you think? You know, what's, what, how does the law read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And of course, when Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly, he said, you've understood what the law and the prophets were all about. This is what they're teaching. Uh, if you do this, you know, do this and you will live. Uh, it is true that if you could do that, and if you could do it from the very moment you came into the world to the very end of your life, you could actually earn eternal life. But nobody can do that, of course, uh, which is why Jesus said, do this and you will live, but you need to realize you can't do this. And of course, I think the parable of the Good Samaritan pointed out the fact he wasn't loving his neighbor. You hate the Samaritans, and yet he used the Samaritans, the hero of this particular parable. Now, we've already looked at uh, last week how Satan will attack our love for God. What we want to do this week is look at how he attacks our love for our neighbor. But again, so that we don't lose perhaps some of the points that we've been looking at, I'd like to do just a bit of brief review of what it is we have been looking at, what it is that Satan is doing to try to weaken us and our ability to serve the Lord. We saw that he attacks the Word of God, uh, and he does it in a variety of ways. He attacks what it actually says, what is written in the Word. He attacks how we understand the Word. That is, you know, uh, whether we see what it means and understand what it means and how it applies. He attacks how we perceive the Word, um, making us look, as he did Eve, uh, at things that he tells us not to do as good things and things he tells us uh, to do as, as bad things. He changes our perception in, in a variety of ways. He tries to distort or even to destroy the standard so that he can get us to stumble and fall, although if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not going to fall entirely, but we can fall into sin, and it will weaken us. So the remedy for that, of course, is to hold fast to the Word of God, to respond to the enemy as Jesus responded to the enemy in the wilderness. It is written. That's how we respond to the lies of the enemy. We counter with the truth of God. Uh, he attacks God, as we've seen, His glory and His beauty, uh, His goodness and His mercy and His grace toward us. By doing this, He tries to undercut our motive to serve the Lord. I mean, what is it that drives us to want to do what the Lord calls us to do, except love for Him. So the enemy is going to attack that as well. But again, the remedy is we need to get into the means of grace. These are the ways we connect with God. These are the ways that we see Him more clearly. These are the ways that He gives to us more of His Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because when we are, the Spirit of God shows us His glory and His beauty. That's the only reason we can see it. And the more we have of His ministry in our lives, the more clearly we'll see it. He, as we saw, attacks our assurance, tries to undercut our confidence that, that we are, in fact, safe. And He tries to get us to become more introspective, being more worried about ourselves than we are about other people so that we don't reach out to them. And we saw that the remedy for that is to make sure that we are looking to Jesus. You can't be saved if you're not trusting Jesus but also knowing what the changes that Jesus makes in our lives look like, what the marks of grace are, and to see those in ourselves and to recognize them and to know that if the evidence is there, uh, if we see any of these uh, evidences of grace, even, even this, to the smallest uh, degree, we can know that we belong to Him. And if we belong to Him, we will always belong to Him. That is uh, something that can help our assurance, our security. Knowing that we're safe, then we can reach out to others to help them find Christ. Now, we saw last week he attacks our love for God. He tells us we don't really need to love him in the way that 
that Jesus tells us, that the law of God tells us, that even this lawyer recognized that we need to love him with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength. Remember, the devil will tell us our love for God doesn't matter. It's his love for us. I mean, the only thing that is a concern to him is that we are safe and that he will love us regardless. So again, as that love for the Lord diminishes as the enemy tells us it's not that important. So does that motivation, so does that drive to do what the Lord calls us to do. So we saw as a remedy for that that we do need to have regard for the Lord's command. He tells us, love Him in this way. That command overrides any opinion that we might have, any opinion the enemy might have. It, it's the only safe way to go, which is to trust what the Lord says. And we do need to remember that God calls us to do this not because He needs our love, because He doesn't, but it's because it's right that we love Him. And it's good that we love Him. We need to love Him in this way because when we love the Lord like this, we will hold on to Him fast and we will do what He calls us to do, which again, He doesn't need for us to do, but we need to do it because it's for our good. So obedience to this command is not how we, of course, save ourselves, but it is the necessary evidence. We're not saved by love, but we will love if we are saved, and we will love the Lord in the way He calls us to love Him, not just in this particular commandment, but as it unfolds in all the other commandments, particularly the first four of the Ten Commandments. Now, as I've already said, Satan also attacks the second part of this commandment, which is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, when we think about these two commandments and which one might be more difficult, I think we'd have to admit loving God is easy in comparison to loving our neighbor because God is lovely. He is beautiful. He is perfect in every way, perfect in His being, perfect in holiness, and perfect in His grace and His mercy that He has shown us. Uh, we, he's given us every reason to love Him. Uh, again, the object is beautiful and what He has done for us is beautiful. And we have the Spirit of God who is continually drawing our attention to that beauty, showing us His beauty, giving us an appreciation for that beauty and giving us a desire for Him. And though it's true that we sometimes do struggle in our love for the Lord, I mean, our love is not perfect, uh, it's because our enemies are working against us. It's because uh, of our flesh that sometimes it seems like a hard thing to do because it's, it hates God, essentially. But if we have the Spirit of God, that love He gives us will overcome that hatred. I mean, that is the blessing of the new covenant. The Spirit of God takes the law of love and puts it in our minds, and He writes it on our hearts, and He gives to us the appreciation for the beauty of this way of loving uh, the Lord and loving our neighbor. So as I've said, loving God is, is really quite easy because He is beautiful, because He is good. But Jesus says we need to love our neighbor as well, and that isn't quite as easy because our neighbor is not perfect, our neighbor is not beautiful, our neighbor doesn't always do nice things, do they? Uh, and I'm talking about believers and unbelievers, but especially unbelievers. You know, as believers, we, we do have something in us that is like God, right? We have the Spirit of God. We have Christ being formed in us. So as believers, we have something of God's moral likeness in us. We have something of His character, which means there is something in us that we can see that's good that we can love. But unbelievers don't have that, okay? They're made in His image. Man is still in the image of God even after the fall, but only in a natural way. You know, he's still spiritual. Um, he, has, he has the capacity to be, to be moral. I mean, to be moral. And he will live forever. There are various ways he reflects the image of God. But he is not like God any longer morally. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the heart of the unbeliever is more like the devil than it's like God. And the reason why it doesn't look that way sometimes is not because they are better than the Bible says they are but it's because God is restraining that sin in their hearts, which he doesn't do to the same degree in the devil's hearts. 
So the Lord calls us to love those who are unlovely. That's what he calls us to do. So this morning, what we want to do is consider another way the enemy works against us, and that is by trying to convince us that we really don't need to love our neighbor. Don't love your neighbor. Don't, don't love him, but rather you're justified in hating them, and you can get even with them. There's all kinds of ways the enemy will try to uh, basically twist what the Lord is telling us. Now, we've already noted in this study that Satan hates God, and he would destroy God if he could. But since he can't, he wants to do the next best thing. He wants to destroy God's image. He wants to destroy man. But we've all already also seen he cannot destroy us. If we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are safe. But he can destroy others. He can destroy unbelievers. And what better way to attack um, our neighbor than by attacking our love for our neighbor. Because what's going to happen to them if they don't hear the gospel? Well, they're going to perish, the Bible says. Who is it that has the gospel? Well, we're the ones who have it. What happens if we don't tell them? What happens if we don't want to tell them because we don't care about them? Well, they're not going to hear they're not going to believe. They will perish. That is Satan's goal. He doesn't want us to love our neighbor. He wants us to hate our neighbor. Now, that's not so difficult for the enemy to accomplish. I mean, it's a lot more difficult for him to get us to hate God, especially since we see his glory and his beauty and all the things about him. He is perfect, but they're not. So it's easier to accomplish this, right? We just noted a moment ago that the, our neighbor is really more like the devil than God, morally. I mean, just think about some of the things that are written about mankind in general in the Bible. Paul writes that the human race, Romans 1.30, are haters of God. Hey, that, that is the characterization of those outside of Jesus Christ. He says in Romans 8.7, they are hostile toward God. He says again in verse 7, they cannot submit to God's law, and the reason is because they hate it. He says in verse 8, they cannot please God. And the reason why they can't is because they cannot submit to the law of God. Now, how do they feel about us? Jesus says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. And why do they hate Jesus? Because he's like God. They hate those who are like God. Why would they hate us? Because we are like Jesus. Okay? Now, that's one thing, but Satan... As I've said, now these are the people that we, that we need to love, that he's calling us to love. But Satan also joins in, and he points out the numerous flaws that the people have, how these, this hatred of God expresses itself in their actions toward one another. I mean, just look at the state that our, you know, that our nation is in and look at all the stuff that's going on between you know, the, the different uh, parties and so forth and things that are saying, but also the way they behave towards us all their inconsistencies, their inconsiderateness, their manipulations, their pride, their lying, and worse, slandering, which lying about other people, even, of course, injuring and murdering. Uh, we have all this going on. He's also, of course, quick to point out what they've done to us personally, okay? Their offenses against us. Their lies against us, their slanders against us, they're taking advantage of us, all their ill will, all their ingratitude. Uh, believers and unbelievers, you know, we can all fall into this kind of a category. And it seems like people particularly hate us when we do the right thing. I mean, that's what Jesus did, right? Why did they hate Jesus? Did Jesus ever do a wrong thing in his life? Everything he did was perfect, and it was perfect love. And yet at the end of his life, or the end of his ministry, how did Israel feel about that? They all hated him, and they cried out for his crucifixion. Doing good does not win friends and influence people when it comes uh, to the world. Rather, it turns them against you. Uh, as American dramatist Claire Booth Luce wrote, and, and this is, you know, again, a famous saying, no good deed goes unpunished. And that certainly is the case today. Now, that kind of hatred 
can affect us. That sin affects us. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 12, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Sin and hatred affects us. It makes us grow cold towards those who don't like us, who hate us. Now, Jesus in this text, I believe, is referring to A.D. 70, 70 A.D., before the destruction of the temple and so forth. But who would argue that this principle isn't always applicable to any situation where you have lawlessness increasing as we see it today? The sins of others can have a cooling effect on our love. And Satan will point that out. But who's behind all the sin that's going on in the world ultimately? Well, Satan is. I mean, he's, he brought this to destroy the human race. He's the one who tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God and to fall into sin. And he's the one who's continually egging people on and encouraging them in sin. So there will be mutual hatred and the desire, again, not to do what the Lord would call us to do towards them. And, of course, we also have our flesh to contend with, which doesn't like what people do to us and doesn't want to overlook it and love them in return, but rather wants to get even with them. That's mankind's nature, and we still have that within ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit, thankfully. It's broken that power over us, but we still have that tendency. We still have that inclination. I mean, I would just consider your own experience. We all experience it. Even in the redeemed state, we have to struggle against it. So the question is, how do we overcome this attack of the enemy? Well, first of all, we need to take to heart the commandment that Jesus gives us. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the one who loved us and laid down his life for us, the one who gives us his Holy Spirit, says to us, love your neighbor as yourself and realize he has given us the ability to do this. Now, I want us to consider what that means because you know, we, you know, we may not necessarily have the clearest idea of what it means. And really, we're, this evening we're going to look at it perhaps more carefully. But right now, let's just consider the form. What's it look like? Okay, what does it look like? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. I think I read this last week as well. He says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Well, what does that look like, Paul? He says this, For this you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, it means we need to keep these commandments. We need to keep these commandments even when they are not keeping these commandments toward us. They're not loving us, but we still need to love them in this way. This is the right form. This is what it's supposed to look like. We need to honor authority as long as it's exercised within the bounds that the Lord gives them that authority, you know, within the bounds of that authority, as long as it's not calling us to disobey God in any way, we have to disobey that. But we have to submit to their authority when they use it in the way that God has intended it. We need to make sure that we are protecting their lives. We need to protect their well-being. We need to protect their sexual purity. We need to protect their possessions. We need to protect their reputation. Even if they're doing all these things against us, this is what we need to do to them. Whatever they do to us, we are not to return evil for evil but a blessing instead. And I think the premier example is our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, having been flogged unjustly for crimes he didn't commit, having been mocked and spit upon and beaten and humiliated, he was crucified. And again, very excruciating pain on the cross. He, he prays for them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus loves them from the cross even though they did not love him. That's what the Lord calls us to do. Now, we also need to think about who is my neighbor. You know, this word neighbor is, is used in the Bible as a preposition. The preposition means near. Okay, so that's what the idea is in neighbor, near. And it's used as a noun, refers to fellow man, or my, my, you know, people in my society, people who are 
near me. My neighbor is anyone who is near me. Uh, it refers to those who are near to us in, in our relationships, uh, such as our family members, you know, husbands and wives. We know in Scripture they're called to love one another. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives are to love their husbands as the church loves Christ. Parents are to love their children and to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And children, of course, are to love and obey their parents. And, of course, we love our more extended family members. I think this commandment has particular reference to brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the Lord actually puts a priority on our love for one another that supersedes that of those outside the church. Paul writes in Galatians 6, verse 10, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Notice the priority of those who are in the church, especially those who are of the household of the faith. But the obligation is to all men. In many instances, this family that we have here is actually closer than our natural family, because sometimes people in our natural family don't know the Lord. But we know each other, and we are all united in one body. And as a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus Christ goes as far as to say in the sheep and goat judgment that whatever we do for one another, we're actually doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. In that judgment, he was not referring to the entire world. He says, inasmuch as you have done this to the least of these brothers of mine, See, I can't refer to the world. That's referring to those who know Jesus. If we love one another in that way, we are loving Jesus. But, as Paul already reminded us, this also applies to unbelievers. And as Jesus reminds us in what we read this morning, it applies even to our enemies. When Jesus told the lawyer that... Um, well, actually, the lawyer told him, and, and Jesus said, you've answered correctly, you need to love your neighbor. The lawyer answered this, asked this question to justify himself, and just, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus replied with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And why did he do that? He did that to show us how far our love is to extend. How great is this love? How, how much should it cover? Well, again, what's the answer to that question? Everyone. He, those in this parable that should have helped this man who, who had been robbed and beaten and stripped and essentially was half dead by the road, those who should have helped him, those who were part of his closest society and community, his own people, passed by on the other side. The one who stopped to help him was actually his enemy. And in a certain sense, the Samaritan hated him as well. Remember the relationship between the Jews and Samaritans. They both hated each other. They both thought they had the true religion. They both thought they were God's people and they were resented one another. But when this Samaritan saw this enemy in need, he felt compassion for him. And he reached out in mercy. And he did it at his own expense. And he took care of him. And then Jesus says, go and do the same. Now, why should we do that? Well, obviously, because Jesus tells us to do that, sort of the easy answer, but there's, he's given us every reason to do this. Let's not forget that we were the wounded Jew by the road, and Jesus was the good Samaritan to us. We were once God's enemies, but he reached out to us in his love and his mercy. Remember what Paul says in Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we hated God, he loved us. So as those who have received mercy, we are to show mercy because that is what the Lord has done for us. Secondly, because the Father continues to do this. I mean, he didn't just show mercy this one time in sending his Son. He continues to show mercy to those who hate him. Uh, remember what we read in our meditation this morning, Luke 6, verses 35 through 36. Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Now, what does that mean? 
it means you will be like him. You will be sharing his nature. For, Jesus says, he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Why should we love our enemies? Because God loves his enemies. Now, I want you to, to notice here the kind of love that the father has for his enemies because that's very important. How can we love people who hate us? Well, this is the kind of love we're supposed to show them, and it doesn't depend on them. It depends on us, just like it does with the Lord. I mean, why does he love anyone? Is it because they're lovely? No, it's because of his own love. Now, we're going to look at that more this evening. But we need to show love because the Father shows love. And we need to do it because that's the example Jesus gave us, right? He was revealing the Father. And what did he show us about the Father? Well, Jesus showed mercy. Everybody that Jesus ministered to, that was an act of mercy, everything he did. And most of what he did, he did toward his enemies while he was on earth. And he continues to show mercy from heaven. I mean, yes, there is wrath revealed from heaven every day, but there's also mercies revealed from heaven every day. Okay, so we need to follow Jesus' example, and of course, he calls us to do the same. Now, on Wednesday, R.C. Sproul uh, basically gave us a quote from Martin Luther that summed this up, I think, very well. Luther said this, every Christian is called to be Christ to his neighbor. And to put that in simple terms, we are to be like Jesus toward them. We are to treat them the way Jesus would treat them. We are to be like him towards these. Now, we can't save them. We're not their Messiah. We're not expected to work out all their difficulties and problems. We can't redeem them. Only Jesus can. We need to point them to Jesus. But the point is, we need to reflect the character of Jesus to them. We need to be that light shining in the darkness. Now, R.C. pointed out that means certain things. What it doesn't mean is we don't just need to be pious. I mean, piety can refer to several things. It has a good meaning, and we need to be, you know, pious in that way. Uh, the pietistic movement, I think most of the people in that movement are the most godly people that ever walk the earth, okay? But it can't just be piety for piety's sake. It can't just be rituals and traditions or things we go through or just things that smack of religiosity you know, where we kind of cloister ourselves in a very holy-looking environment and we spend time with God, that's pious. But that's not what it means to reflect Jesus to our neighbor. It's also more than being moral. You know, different people have different ideas of what morality is, and you can be a very moral person and still not be Christ to your neighbor. And he said it was more than being spiritual or having the qualities or the nature of the Holy Spirit. We need those things. But those are only means to an end. He said we're Christ to our neighbor when we are righteous, when we basically put into action what it is that God tells us to do. Now, we need to be moral. We need to be pious. We need to be spiritual in order to do this. But this is actually what we're supposed to be doing. We need to act on what God says. We need to keep the commandments that Paul reminded us of in uh, Romans chapter 13 what the fulfillment of the law actually is. Love is the fulfillment of the commandments. Now, that's how Jesus, remember, showed the Father to the world. John 5, verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. What were the works that Jesus was referring to? Well, they were miracles, but they were also every single one. Have you ever noticed that every single miracle that Jesus actually performed? It was meant to stop traffic. It was meant to get people to pay attention to him so they would listen to what he had to say. But every single one of those miracles benefited somebody, right? They were acts of mercy. And so our Lord tells us that we need to follow that example. As Jesus showed the Father to the world, we need to show Jesus to the world. If we call ourselves Christians, we're, we're essentially asking people to come and see Jesus. You know, look at me and you'll see Jesus. This is what Jesus is like. But what if we call ourselves Christians but don't act like Jesus? Well, then we're misrepresenting him. 
then we're giving the world a reason to reject Jesus rather than to receive him. The world is looking at us and evaluating Jesus. We need to make sure that we represent him well. We need to be Christ to our neighbor. We need to be merciful just as he is merciful. And then finally, when are we to do this? Well, I think obviously at all times, but especially when we see somebody who is in need. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan that we were reading earlier. It dealt with a need. Uh, The one who proved to be a neighbor was the one who saw the need and didn't pass by him, but actually met that need. Solomon writes in Proverbs 3, verses 27 and 28, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it, when you have it with you. We should be those who are ready to show mercy when we see somebody who needs help, and we have the power to meet that need. I mean, we may see somebody who has needs beyond what we're able to do, in which case we need to go find somebody who can help that individual. But we need to be a good neighbor. We need to be a good Samaritan and not simply pass by it and leave it for someone else. Or worse, leave them, as it were, alone without what they need and, and so endanger uh, their lives. Now, this evening, we're going, to, as I've said, to refine this a bit further. We, we've seen the form that love is to take. There's also a heart behind this that we need to have, without which, even though it may benefit somebody still, it will not be pleasing to God. So we want to look at the qualities of this kind of love that the Lord is calling us, what it is and what it isn't. And as we understand that, we'll see how it is we can love those who are unlovely and in so doing, overcome the attack of the enemy to try to get us from loving these people so that they might come to know the Lord Jesus. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to, to help us, help us to, to love and to be merciful.